So Hebrews chapter 10, working our way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the New Testament on Sunday mornings. We're in the Old Testament on Wednesday evenings. We'll be in Isaiah chapter 57 this week. And as always, it's, it's amazing to see how the, the Old Testament fits with the New as we work our way through uh, both sides of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, so to speak, uh, in the same week. And uh, I think we've seen some of that. If you were here with us Wednesday night, there were certainly some indications of, of exactly the same sort of thing that's being said here this morning in Hebrews chapter 10. So let's go to Lord in prayer for our time in Bible study that we might devote this time to him. And Lord, we, we do desire exactly that, Lord, that this would be your time, not ours. Uh, we understand the nature of the word Lord, that uh, we're subject to you, that you've you bought us by, by your blood, Lord. Uh, we're we're blood-bought children of God, born again uh, with a new nature, desiring to hear from you and, and to be taught and fed and led by your Holy Spirit, Lord. And that's what we have come for. We haven't come for stories or, or anecdotes. We, we've come to hear from you, Lord. And Father, we devote ourselves, our hearts. We pray especially for anyone here who may be Uh, in this house today or maybe even listening online that has not come to the understanding of what it means to be a born-again child of God, uh, that they may quickly and resolutely come to that understanding this morning, that you would use this time especially uh, for those that are in the greatest need of you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 10 in the book of Hebrews begins with uh, a, a list of things that the law cannot do. What the law cannot do for you. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of things, can never, udipote in the Greek, and it, it literally means it's strong, it's never, ever, never, ever, ever. The law can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, Make those who approach perfect. And this word for perfect is, it's similar to the word that Jesus cried out on the cross. You know, it's finished. Uh, to telestai, the, root, the same root, teleos. Perfect means complete. It's interesting when we talk about people of the Jewish faith who have become born again, that they've, they've come into the New Testament, they've come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that we call them completed Jews. And in a similar fashion, that, that same word being used here. For then, this, this idea of the shadow, the law cannot make you perfect, never could, never ever could. For then, and employing logic here, who I believe is, is Paul, part of his logical mind, his legal mind. For then would they not have ceased to be offered if those sacrifices had been effective? For then would they not have ceased to be offered For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year on the Day of Atonement. For it is not possible, remember these are the things that the law cannot do, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. While it does, speaking of the law, reveal your sin, and the law is especially effective at doing that, while it does reveal your sin, it cannot take away your sin. That's what he says there in the last part of verse 1 and also in verse 4. Otherwise, the blood of bulls and goats would not have been offered constantly. And that is a logical statement. That's a hey, wait a minute, let's, let's really think about why is this being offered over and over and over and over again if it was truly effective to take away sins, which it is not. And the reason is because a shadow is powerless. Now, it may bear an image of light above on the ground, but it's powerless powerless to do anything, and that's what he says in verses 2 and 3. And and Jesus spoke prophetically in Psalm chapter 40, which is a messianic psalm of David. And it's kind of neat that 
the author of Hebrews has included this in this way because we're going to see examples uh, of what it means when we call a psalm a messianic psalm, that even though it's written by David, that Jesus is actually speaking in Psalm chapter 40, and, and that's at least in part why we do call it a messianic psalm. So Jesus spoke prophetically in Psalm chapter 40 that he would become the, underscore the, maybe even circle the word the, that he would become the sacrifice for sin, the blood of bulls and goats depicted. So the shadow was depicting the ultimate sacrifice to come in Jesus Christ. And we've been studying these things for three chapters. This is the third straight chapter that we've been studying these things. And when the Holy Spirit, when the author of God's word, who is the Holy Spirit, repeats similar thinking over and over and over again, that tells us a lot about ourselves. It tells us that repetition is the best teacher. It also tells us that we need to pay attention because the Holy Spirit is really emphasizing these points. And so they must be really, really, really important to God. Therefore, verse 5, when he came into the world, he said, and again, this is Psalm chapter 40, written by David, and the author of Hebrews is telling us, this is Jesus speaking a thousand years before he was born into the world, and he's speaking in the form of this messianic psalm. Listen to what he says. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Now we have in the following verses, in the next two verses, the next three verses, an example of expository teaching. And expository teaching, the meaning of expository teaching, which we practice here, is this. Read the word and explain what the word is saying. Read the word and explain what the word is saying. That's what expository teaching is. And the idea is that you would understand the sense and the meaning of God's word. And so we limit ourselves to that, as the author of Hebrews does here. Whoever is writing this, and I think it's Paul because of this very thing, is incredibly brilliant, a true Bible scholar, understanding the nature of the kind of things that Jesus explained after he was resurrected from the dead. Remember how he met on the Emmaus Road with two of his disciples, and he talked with them? And as he walked and talked with them, they said after he left them that their hearts were burning. And what Jesus was teaching them was what the, what the Old Testament had to say about Messiah and who he was and when he was and how he was. And then when he broke the bread, all of a sudden he was revealed to them and disappeared and they ran back to Jerusalem a few miles away, to let the disciples in the upper room know that Jesus, the resurrected Christ, had literally appeared to them. And then Jesus came, and he met with the disciples in the upper room, and what did he do? He gave them a Bible study, and he started in the beginning of God's Word, and he went right through, and the only thing that existed in God's Word was the Old Testament at that time, and he went right through the Old Testament revealing to them every scripture that spoke of the Messiah, the coming Messiah, and how he could be identified, how he was identified as the Messiah, not by anything he did necessarily except for the things that he did that lined up exactly with what God's word declared about who the Messiah would be, when the Messiah would be, and how the Messiah would be. It was a Bible study. This is a Bible study. And so the author of Hebrews explains what was just taken from, what was just lifted from, what was just quoted from Psalm chapter 40. Previously saying, explaining what's declared there in verse 5, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law, 
Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first. Here's the explanation. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, by whose will? God's will. By that will, we, you and I, and the Hebrew believers, we have been sanctified, purified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, and here's the important part, once for all. All of God's word speaks of this. That's a fascinating thing, especially if you are Jewish or have a Jewish background or have Jewish friends or loved ones, as I hope that we all do. And we love the Jewish people. Our our Messiah uh, came out of the Jewish faith. He was a Jewish Messiah. And uh, in the early days of the church, most of the church was comprised of Jewish people that had placed their faith in the Christ, and the Christ is just the Greek version of the word Messiah, which is the Hebrew version of that, that same word. Christ is not the, Jesus' last name. It is his, his title, and so, you know, his, his lordship depicts his role over mankind. And so all, this, this might come as a surprise to some of you, it shouldn't, all of God's word, and remembering that, that even at this time, as Paul is sending out these epistles to the churches uh, around the region that he has visited on his missionary journeys, these still have not been compiled into what we know of as the New Testament. That would not happen um, in, in his lifetime. And so when it says, and, and when he appeals to the fact that all of God's word, the volume of the book, Jesus declares, the volume of the book speaks of me. All of the Old Testament speaks of Jesus. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. All of God's word points to the Lord Jesus Christ. As he says in verse 7, in the volume of the book, the quote from Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8, in the, in the volume of the book, in the entirety of the book, God's word it is written of me. Now, the sacrificial system, as is explained here, was not pleasing to God, but was instead remedial, as he says in in verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And the shedding of blood for remission of sin was the least desirable option. There were many other options available to the children of God, Right? In the same way that there are many other options for us, available to us, other than blood sacrifice, chief among them being obedience. Obedience to the righteousness of God, obedience to the commands of God. So the shedding of blood for remission of sin was the least desirable option. And remember, he's he's talking to Jewish believers, those who have come out of the Jewish faith and the sacrificial system was still in place during this time. This is before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, believed to be sometime in the, in the region of, of AD 62. And so, you know, if, if they're at Jerusalem, they're still seeing these kinds of activities and rituals and practices going on. And this idea that you would <clears throat> bring a, a blood sacrifice to cover your sin, well, I mean... It's effective for the remedial process, but it's not God's desire because in the presentation of that animal, what you're saying is I'm a sinner. I, I have, it's not just that I'm a, I'm a sinner. In fact, because I was born a sinner, it is I have recently committed a sin. And that sin can only be covered by the blood sacrifice of this animal That I present. Now, a a more desirable option to God was what was declared in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which sounds 
more like the New Testament. It, it sounds more like something that Jesus would say than it does in the way that some people think about you know, the judgmental God of, of the Old Testament, which, by the way, is not true at all. God is every bit as graceful in the Old Testament as he is in the New, and he is every bit as judgmental in the New Testament as he is in the Old. So this idea that somehow God has changed his character between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we need to dismiss that from our minds. Listen to what God says. Listen to what God teaches them to say about the God they serve. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, this is known of as the Shema. Shema literally means saying. And even to this day, even down to this day, when the Jews meet in the synagogue, this is the, the standard passage that they read in the same way that some of you who come out of a denominational church background, you might have a congregational prayer for forgiveness or something like that in the liturgy of, of what you're going through in the course of a service. And that prayer will culminate in the Lord's Prayer. All of a sudden, you'll be praying through, and the pastor will be leading you in prayer, and everybody will be praying silently, and all of a sudden, you'll hear the pastor say, Our Father. And when the pastor says, Our Father, everyone joins in and begins to recite the Lord's Prayer. Same way with the Shema, the saying that would be both um, friendly and um, traditional and comforting to the Jews to hear this statement, even to this day. And it goes like this, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now there's a great revelation of the triune nature of God in that statement because the word employed for God is the word Elohim, which means three, three or more. Um, El for God, E-L, Elah for two, a plural, and Elohim for three. So the emphasis, the, the statement and remembering that, that Moses, if he knew about this, we don't know how he would have known about it except by the Holy Spirit. So he writes these things, he's writing in singular tense, but he is speaking about the polarity in the Godhead in the same way that he did in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Speaking of the oneness of the nature of God. Well, wait a minute, you just said that one, our God exists in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, it's important to know and to learn um, at least how to look up Hebrew so that when you're studying the Old Testament, you can refer to the words. And the word for one, is there a disagreement between Elohim and one? Three or more and one? No, because the word for one is the Hebrew word echad. You get to use that sound, echad. I'm not really good at it, but uh, maybe if you're from New York, you're, you're already <laughs> equipped. I was sort of raised with Southern parents, so we don't do that thing very good. But. It's the Hebrew word echad, and, and echad, means, echad means compound unity. In the same way that you are the body of Christ in a sterile. And so one body of Christ, but many distinct persons comprising that, that body of Christ. So fascinating that way back in the Old Testament, in the day of Moses, Moses writing this, and he says, listen to this. This is the part that sounds like something that Jesus would say. And in fact, Jesus did say this. He said it's the great commandment, it's the greatest commandment in the law when he was asked by a lawyer, by a Jewish lawyer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So the Ten Commandments were given in Exodus chapter 20, and then there was a compilation of some 613 commands in the Jewish law that, that Moses was given through Leviticus, and through the remainder of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Then we get to Deuteronomy, and there's a restating of the law. It's the second telling of the law, which is why it's called Deuteronomy. And so you have all this legal stuff, but here's the emphasis that God desires, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This, this is what God desires. He didn't desire blood sacrifice. He desired for you to love him so well with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, that there would be no question about your desire to keep the law, 
because you would understand in, in the loving nature of God the reason that he gave the law was to provide reasonable boundaries that when you exceed those boundaries, it can only bring harm and destruction into your life. And as long as you stay within the boundaries, there is true freedom in the love that we have for God. Now instead, the, the way people operate, they step outside those boundaries because there are alluring things on the other side of the wall and they trip and they fall into sin and then they gotta bring in a blood sacrifice and that's not desirable to God because that means that you've harmed yourself in some way, shape, or form. And so now you're on the remedial process rather than the most desirable, pleasing process to God. He goes on to say, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. It's, it's of your desire, not have to. I don't keep the law of God because I have to, because I want to, because I love him so well. That, that's God's plan. That's God's desire. And not only that, but you shall teach them diligently to your children, which is what's going on over there in the children's ministry today, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You need to realize if you're a parent today, your children today are learning Hebrews chapter 9. You learned Hebrews chapter 9 last week to prepare you to spend the week dialoguing with your child about the content of Hebrews chapter 9. And if, you, if it's somehow flown out of your head, well, then you can come to our website and, and you can listen to Hebrews chapter 9 all over again. And you can begin to dialogue with your children, teaching them the word of God because the reinforcement that they get in the home, the, the learning that they get in the home of the word of God is, is the foundation. What we do here should only be remedial for what you are providing both in the example of the way that you live because if there's any disconnect from the word of God that you're teaching them and the way that you live, you might as well just forget about it because kids have a hypocrisy meter. It's one of the things that they're born with. And if they sense there's a separation between what you say and what you do, then it's, it's virtually worthless, virtually worthless. So you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And again, these are, these are spiritual words that the Jews did take literally. And so they wrapped, you know, cords. They have these little boxes called phylacteries, and they, they write out or they print out some of the scripture, and they put it in that little box. These are not things to be taken literally. He's talking about having the word of God in your heart. And, and just, you know, the, the things that you touch should be reminding you of the word of God. Bind them, um, and, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. Sure, that's a fine thing to do literally, but it's talking about spiritually. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, you know, and that, that just genuine commitment that comes from your heart. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 18, speaking of the loving nature of God and, and what he truly desires, he says in Ezekiel chapter 18, basically in the middle of your Bible, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, this is God, this is the Old Testament God saying this, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. That's God's desire. If God has no pleasure. I mean, that's, that's part of our fallen nature that we do take pleasure when an evil man dies. God doesn't. God sees that as, as the loss of a soul that he has both created and intended for the purpose of loving relationship with himself. So what God, what God desires above all else, the same thing is true for us as it was for the Hebrew believers being addressed here or the Old Testament um, scholars that might be studying God's word. What God desires is obedience. He doesn't desire, I mean, sacrifice is there as a remedy for sin, but it is not pleasing. And I, and I hope you understand that. It is not pleasing, but remedial. God desires obedience. And the sacrificial system of religious works and rituals can appeal to the flesh. 
for the very reason that I spoke of earlier. It gives you a way out. It also gives you a way into sin perceptibly that, that I can jump over the wall of the limitations of God's law where I'm free to move about the, the room. I have this, this liberty in, in Christ, this liberty of, of righteousness and the pursuit of anything within the confines of what God says is a blessing to me, is good for me, is healthy for me. But occasionally I'll stray over that wall and, and I might even stray over that wall because I understand that if I do fall and fail on the outside of the confines of what God's word has declared, that I can kill an animal. I can, I can bring an animal and I can kill it and I can have that blood flow and I can be sprinkled with blood and, and I can go on about my business. Same sort of deal with Mardi Gras. You see it every year. Several days of the most wicked debauchery and drunkenness you could possibly think of, followed by what? Repentance. Is it genuine? Put an ash on your forehead. 40 days of Lent. You're giving something, really, to God. To You've just, you know, done all sorts of wicked things intentionally, not accidentally. You've been part of these madding crowds. It was amazing that the first thing that they did after Katrina in, in New Orleans, reestablish Mardi Gras. Let's get wickedness going again. Let's get it rolling again. It's, it's a, Mardi Gras is a religious festival, believe it or not. It's Fat Tuesday. It's a religious festival that where everybody can just be free before they have to buckle down and do God things again. It's tragic that that sort of mindset and heart set appeals to people. And yet we know that it, it does. The sacrificial system of religious works and rituals can appeal to the flesh because it presents the opportunity for the flesh to engage in a perilous game which Satan only encourages. Why? Because if Satan can have you believe you owe God anything other than your love, he's won the battle that may lead to him winning the war for your soul. And your soul is precious to God. As Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Listen to the heart of what Jesus declared um, in this passage of Scripture because it tells you something about how God sees you. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? And literally what Jesus is saying there is that in the entirety of the known universe, your soul, your soul, is more precious to God than that. And you could gain all of the universe, all of the world, all of the known world, somehow, some way. And if you lost your soul, would that be worth, worth it? Would that be worthwhile to you? And I love to know, I think it's important for me to know, that God values my soul that highly. It's that precious to him. It's more precious than all of his creation. My soul, your soul, each individual soul is worth more to God than the entirety of the universe. My soul, your soul, is so precious to God that he sent his only son to be the sacrifice for sin forever. And every, verse 11, Hebrews chapter 10, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool very patient 
For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant, speaking of the new covenant, this is the covenant, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, the new covenant of God. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Now, how does that take place? How does the entirety of God's law get written in your heart and placed in your mind? That only happens by becoming a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus Christ who said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. In that transaction, when you make known your desire to be filled by the Spirit of Christ, he fills you. And when the Spirit of Christ is made alive in you, then you have the entirety of the law of the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit, within the confines of your heart, and the Holy Spirit will begin to divinely guide you. You won't need an external guide anymore. The Holy Spirit will bring either conviction of righteousness or conviction of sin. And it's as if you're walking down that aisle and you're about to stray into that seat, and the Holy Spirit will go, no, no, don't. Keep walking straight. And then you, you stray over to the, no, no, don't. And you'll hear that voice of God, and you'll recognize that the Holy Spirit has been made alive in you. This is a supernatural relationship that we have with God. It's not meant to be natural. It's not meant to be by external rule or by willpower. We've already proven to ourselves, maybe some of you are here today, or maybe all of you are here today because you've already proven to yourself that your willpower is not strong enough for you to resist sin. Isn't that true? Because the flesh, until the Holy Spirit is made alive in you, the flesh rules. Hey, your, your, your soul will, will battle with the flesh, but you'll lose over time. You will lose over time. And, and again, that's, you know, people come, they say they've come to the end of themselves. They've, they've understood that, that the battle has been lost and they're given over to wickedness or depravity or sin, and, and, and because we were created with the conscience by God for that very reason that we would have an understanding that when we do fall, when we do headlong go into depravity, that, that the, the conscience is, is screaming out that there must be a better way. And in fact, the, the reason that we call the fall of man the fall of man is because of this very thing. That, that our conscience leads us to, our conscience demonstrates to us that at some point, humanity must have been higher than it is now because our conscience tells us, our conscience informs us about a higher way of life that we seem incapable of doing. And so the gap that exists between what our conscience is telling us to do and what we actually do do that's how fallen we are. That's, our fall, that's the revelation of our fallen nature, let alone the fact that if you don't discipline those cute little babies that are born into the world, they will turn into hellions on their own. They must be disciplined. And, and so the, the sin nature of man is on full display, and the fallen nature of man is, we're informed of that by our conscience. And so this, this new covenant, I'm, I'm going to write that when, when you become a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to have that entirety of law in your heart. And I talk about this all the time. In the Old Testament, you won't find what channel to watch on your television because televisions didn't exist then, but the Holy Spirit will tell you what channel to watch on your television because he exists forever in your heart. And he keeps up with the times. And he doesn't keep up with the times in terms of moral relevance. He does keep up with the times in terms of God's righteousness. And that's why we find ourselves at odds with the world's definitions of the new world's definitions of marriage and, and things of that sort. Because our conscience, being informed by the Holy Spirit, won't allow us to go down that path. Why? Because it's destructive. It's damaging. It causes harm and god loves god loves people so well that he would do everything he can in the realm of love 
to provide a way out for those who would escape. And the way out is the power of the Holy Spirit being made alive in your heart, that you make yourself a slave to righteousness instead of a slave to sin. And, and many people don't even realize that they are a slave to sin until the Holy Spirit comes alive in their heart, and then it's like a, it's like a, a reawakening moment. It, it's a renewal. It's, it's a redemption. It's, it's an understanding that, wow, I, I didn't even know I was a sinner. And then you find that not only were you a sinner, but you were the worst of sinners. And then you begin to count how many sins that you had committed, and then you have great joy over the fact that Jesus came and died to pay the price for all of that, that sin. And so, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them down. Then he adds, listen to this, their sins and their lawlessness, their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission or forgiveness of sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. The Holy Spirit introduced the new covenant, which is spoken of in verses 15 through 17, about a thousand years after the old covenant was given. And we might refer to the old covenant as the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, that, hey, these Hebrew believers are still being drawn to. They're still sensing the appeal of that, that legal foundation. The old covenant was effective in identifying the Jewish people as the children of God. That all of these surrounding cultures, God chose these people, this peculiar people, not because they were mighty, not because they were great, but because God chose them, period. And he chose them to be an evangelistic example to the entire world, and he gave them his protective law of love in this covenant that they would be an example to all the surrounding cultures. And that's why, if you look at the design of the tabernacle followed by the design of the temple, it has these huge outer courts where the people can come and worship. And one of those courts is called the Court of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles could come in and they could observe these Hebrew people worshiping their invisible God. Now they have all these statues and pagan gods and all these rituals, child sacrifice and all this stuff, and they're working, you know, seven days a week um, without relief, no vacation, no days off. And here you have this peculiar people inside the confines of this nation, and they're taking every seventh day off. That's a revolutionary thought in the culture of the world, anthropologically. That, that, that was completely unique, that even the, the lowest peasant would have a day off. And the day off was given, intended to worship the Lord as an example of the fact that he rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath law. And then every seventh year off, all their debts would be forgiven and all the slaves would be set free. And God would provide as they just kick back in a, listen to this, a sabbatical year. You ever heard that phrase near college professors? I'm taking off a whole year. I'm going on a sabbatical. And then they'll tell you, well, I don't believe in God. Well, where did that principle come from? God was the one that came up with the principle of a sabbatical year. So you're taking God up. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, knowing where words came from sometimes is, is important. So they have the whole seventh year off, and God promised to provide for them enough in the seventh year and in the eighth year that when they began to plant again in the eighth year, that uh, they would have provision. And then God said, well, I want you to take every 49th, every seventh seven-year period of time off, and your jubilee every 50th year off. So you can imagine the cultures around them working away, working away, working away, working away, and here on the other side of the the fence, so to speak, in this nation, these peculiar people worshiping this invisible God. Wow, they're, they're kicking back every Saturday. Every seventh year, they take the whole year off, and, and yet still they're fed. And then in the eighth year, and still they're fed. And then on the 49th year, they take that year off, and, and the 50th year, and all the slaves are set free, and all the debts are forgiven, and these people are partying hardy, and they've got great songs, and they're worshiping the Lord. It was designed to be evangelistic. 
Only it never was because the Jews, instead of making it, allowing it to be evangelistic, they made it, they made it legalistic and they changed it from what they want to do, which is what God desired, to what they have to do. And they actually began to look over the walls themselves and see these other pagan cultures worshiping statues. They had gods that they could lay their eyes on. And so they began to follow after them rather than them beginning to follow after the Jews. Tragic. But it's still, the Old Covenant, all this legal basis, it did identify the, the Jews as being the children of God. And, and this was paramount, the purpose of the law, and in demonstrating their need for a Savior, since an external, perfect, though it is, law, is impossible for any fallen man to keep, especially when you understand that the law also deals with the heart. It's not necessarily sins of commission. It also includes sins of omission. It also includes how you think about your fellow man, as Jesus would inform us later in the Sermon on the Mount. <coughs> Thus, the fact that they could not keep the law, that there was no fallen man that could ever keep this perfect law, necessitated the continual sacrifice of bulls and goats. And even, in, even the high priest was included in this. Even the high priest had to confess he was a sinner and demonstrate he was a sinner. Of this people, the, the children of God, of this people who should have been first in line for the promise of the new covenant, Jesus said this about this people in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, should sound familiar to your ears, to your ears. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by what? By your tradition, by making it legalistic rather than based in love, by making it have to rather than want to. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. See, these people are hypocrites. There's, there's nothing in their heart toward me. They are not loving the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their soul. And that, that may not be obvious to all the people around you because you may be appearing to conform to whatever righteous standard the particular culture that you live in obeys, generally speaking, but God sees. And, and Jesus is informing us that, that God sees all. So of this people who should have been first in line for the promise of the new covenant, wow, there's this new covenant that's been promised. That's where I want to head. That's, that's the direction for my new life. That's what Jesus said about those people. These people, they honor me with their lips, but in their heart, they're far from me. And this is the same issue that Hebrew believers are being tempted with right now in this, that, that Paul or the author of Hebrews is dealing with in this letter. They're being tempted to go back to the religious tradition that has such an appeal to the flesh that no longer means anything to God. What had been established by God as a basis for loving relationship had been overwhelmed, even replaced by religious tradition. And when Jesus came, think of it, 500 years after the new covenant was given, old covenant, 1,000 years, new covenant. New covenant is in the Jewish law. It's part of the Jewish law and the prophets. It's in their word. It's in their book. 500 years before Christ, Christ comes along and now, the new covenant comes into full effect. And in his faithful accomplishment, he sat down. 
The high priest never sat down. There was no place for him to sit. He was busy. He was working. He was always working. Jesus, when his sacrifice, when his perfect sacrifice had been accomplished, he sat down. Where did he sit down? He sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Under the old covenant, the high priest could not even bring us into the Holy of Holies, which was but a shadow, but a picture, but a type of what exists in the kingdom of heaven. And we are about to find that not only has Jesus sat down, but he is encouraging us to come into the reality of the Holy of Holies in heaven, the highest, the holiest. And we are being encouraged to come in. How? Well, we read that all the work of salvation was completely finished. And the old system of animal sacrifices is not only powerless, it's pointless. You can't accomplish anything. Now that Jesus has ultimately paid the price for sin once for all, the blood of bulls and goats, or whatever work you would try to do to make yourself righteous in God's eyes, it's powerless and it is pointless. That's what he says in verse 18. Now where there is remission of these, there is, it's, there's no longer an offering for sin. Once Jesus has accomplished his work, there's, there's no longer any other offering for sin. Therefore, he says in verse 19, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. These are the unalienable rights and privileges, again, as he says in verse 19, by the boldness of faith in Christ, and in his grace, these are the unalienable rights. Rights from God. Rights purchased by God. Rights purchased by his ownership of us. These are the rights and privileges of the born-again child of God. The veil at the temple was torn as the veil of Jesus' flesh was broken, as he says there in, in verse 20. Matthew's gospel, chapter 27, put it this way. You know the story when Jesus was on the cross as he gave up his spirit. Something amazing happened, and it made a huge impact on those who saw. And we read in Matthew's gospel, chapter 27, verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. He was not killed. He gave up his spirit. He voluntarily died. He had a loud voice, even at the end. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple, 90 feet tall. Some people say three feet thick. Some people say 18 inches thick. It took several hundred priests just to manipulate the weight of that curtain in the temple. That veil was rent. That veil was torn into from top to bottom. The way into the holiest of holies was made open and available. And you can just imagine the priest fleeing out of that spot, their, their eyes seeing what had never been beheld before by man, by any man except the high priest. And all of a sudden it was naked and available, and God was demonstrating now all can come because 
the veil of Jesus' flesh has been torn, making a way into the holiest of holies, and not the shadow of the holiest of holies, but the literal, the true, the spiritual holiest of holies in the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to say, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, the rocks were split, the graves were opened, and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves, note this, after his resurrection, not at his death, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God, and truly he was. He is now and forevermore our great high priest, as is declared there in verse 21 of Hebrews chapter 10. He is our great high priest in heaven, in heaven, according to the order of Melchizedek, who we studied in Hebrews chapter 5 through chapter 7. Therefore, let us, none of this is under compulsion, this is all a matter of your desire out of your love for God. That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And of that desire, we see three encouragements here in this passage. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. Since these things have taken place, since the way into the holiest of holies has been made open and available to all who will come, let us. It's an encouragement. It's even an exhortation. But it's not by force. It's not at the point of a gun or a sword or a bayonet or anything of the sort. It's this is available to you. And since this is freely available to you, since this has been made available to you at such great price, God demonstrating his great love for you, would you return that love by now coming into boldly, he says there, having boldness to enter the holiest by what? By the blood of Jesus. Let us, he says, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. And we're gonna start talking about faith now as we move into chapter 11 and he's setting the stage for that. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What's being declared there to you Jewish believers and to anyone else for that matter is that all of the typology of that sacrificial system, which was important, it's all been fulfilled now. And so the typology is no longer necessary except for just the, the historicity of it to, to demonstrate to you what God's plan had been all along. Secondarily, he says in verse 24, let us, or 23, let us hold fast the confession or testimony of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And if you become a born-again believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, which is what that means, yeah, you're going to be tested. And you're going to be tried. And you may even be persecuted. Hold fast. Hold fast according to the way that he who promised held fast, even to the end. He was faithful even to the end, and he is calling on us to be faithful to the end. Why? That we would be preserved into eternal life. And then he says in verse 24, and let us, another encouragement, another exhortation, if you will, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. To be part of the body of Christ is an amazing thing. And to be part of the body of Christ means to actually be part of the body of Christ. As he goes on to say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. What day approaching? Well, we read about it last week in chapter 9, verse 28, the, the day of Christ's return for his church, the rapture of the church. It's imminent. It could happen at, at any moment. And so as we see this day approaching, and we are living in the last days, we are seeing this day approaching, 
could be any day now, the exhortation is, the encouragement is to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and so much more as we see the day approaching. And this is why the enemy um, puppeteering behind these, these governors and such, commanding the churches not to meet, were in violation of what God's law declared, what God's desire was for his church that we would not forsake the meeting the assembling of ourselves together and pay attention to that word assembling because some of us take that word too lightly because i can take a thousand piece puzzle and i can dump it out on my the coffee table in my living room and have a nice little pile of puzzle pieces that would be called a gathering of those pieces that is not what's being referred to here what's being referred to here is the assembly the assembling of ourselves together thinking of each one of you as I look at your faces as a puzzle piece and putting those pieces together where they fit and function to reveal the picture of Jesus Christ and only by being put together only by being assembled and being placed in the position that God has for you given by the the supernatural shape of, of whatever it is in, in your spiritual gifting and to just be a big lump of pieces in the middle of the table, that accomplishes nothing. It is only when they are assembled, not gathered, but assembled together. And so the leading of the Holy Spirit applies to what he would have you do and where he would have you fit and function in the body of Christ. And just coming to church, it doesn't accomplish that. God has so much more for you in this life. And he follows all this by a, a, a warning. And the warning is this. It is dangerous to come this far through all the knowledge that is provided to you and, and the fact that you have been walking with Christ into this, this born-again life. It is dangerous to come this far and look back. Don't look back to the former life. Even when the former life was good, even when the former life was religious, even when the former life was confined under the rules and regulations to the best of your ability in some sort of righteous, self-righteous practice, don't look back at that stuff. That was the history of the Israelites as they wandered in the desert, wasn't it? They were always looking back to Egypt, and Egypt was a type of sin. Oh, we missed the, the flesh pots and the, the leeks. Even though we were enslaved to sin, at least we had, you know, radishes and turnips. And... <laughs> it's dangerous. This is, what's coming next is a severe warning. It's dangerous to come this far and look back. And this warning wouldn't be here if we were not capable of it. So it's dangerous to come this far and look back to submit yourself to the temptations that may be offered there by, by looking back at the so-called fun that you used to have, forgetting the, the toilet-hugging nights and that sort of stuff. It is the worst of human tragedies to go back. It's dangerous to come this far and to look back. It is the worst of human tragedies to go back. And now again, as we talked in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, we're talking about apostasy. We're not talking about backsliding. We're talking about apostasy. And apostasy, especially in the pursuit of a shadow that is spoken of in verse 1. Oh, it's a terrible human tragedy. And we see it happen, and we have seen it happen historically, and Paul, or the author of Hebrews, is certainly warning against that here. He says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge, the, the epinosis in the Greek, the full knowledge, um, it's inarguable that what he's talking about here is someone who has committed their life to Christ. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And again, we're talking about apostasy. We're not talking about backsliding. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If somebody strayed out of the camp in the time of Moses, 
and they were seen by witnesses worshiping at some idol on a high hill under the green trees, and the two witnesses came back and reported it to the, 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 the Sanhedrin, basically, the, the legal council, the 70 elders that were serving Moses, that person would be stoned. He'd be taken outside the camp, and he would be stoned on the testimony of two or more witnesses. And so the same thing is in practice here spiritually of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has he be thought worthy who has trampled the son of God underfoot counted the blood of the covenant of which he was sanctified a common thing and limited insulted the spirit of grace it's a fearful thing it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This idea of trampling the, the Son of God is underfoot is, um, it, it literally means to stomp on as a, a detestable thing. It, it means to reject with great disdain. And to make the sacrifice of Jesus a common thing? Well, he's just a man. He's just another man being crucified on a cross. And there's been thousands of men down through history, especially in the time of the Romans, that were crucified on crosses. What's the big deal? No more effective than any other man. That's what it means to make the sacrifice. It's koinos in the Greek. Um, it's just, he's just another man, not God in flesh. And the exhortation reminds us of what Jesus said about Judas Iscariot, who I think at least is a type of this in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, uh, chapter 26, verse 24, Jesus said, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of God is betrayed. And then he said, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And the same is true for anyone who rejects Jesus Christ, by the way. It would have been better to have not been born. He says, and this is something that we need to realize, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And to the Hebrews, to the Hebrew believers, to the Jewish believers, you've already endured so much, he says. Um, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you became born again, after you became followers of Jesus Christ, verse 32, you endured great struggle with sufferings. You were persecuted. You were put out of your families. You were ostracized. You were made fun of. You were mocked. You were spit upon. You were degraded. You were told that you were going to hell. And you endured all that and all those personal suffering. Maybe some of you were beaten and arrested, and Paul did beat and arrest Jews who had become believers in Jesus Christ. He personally killed and put in jail those who were followers of Jesus Christ. He was the author of persecution as well as the remedy for it later on. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. And then he says, and I think this is the the greatest clarity in my mind at least of who wrote this epistle and I think it's Paul. For you had compassion on me in my chains. And Paul is known to say that over and over and over again. You had compassion on me in my chains because you identified with me. You identified with the fact that I was arrested for my faith in Jesus Christ. And and you stood by me in that. You had compassion on me, for me in that. And, and, And you joyfully accepted the plunder of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Don't turn back. You've already been through so much. And the same is true for all of us, really, to one degree or another. 
And then he goes on to say, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, parhesia, um, the absolute assurance. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Eternal life is pretty, pretty great. Eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, pretty great reward, is it not? For you've been freed, excuse me, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise, the promise of eternal life, the promise of eternal life. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and not tarry. Now, the just shall live by faith, as I mentioned, we're going to move into chapter 11 the next time we're back together with me teaching. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we, yes, we, are not those who draw back to perdition or waste or destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this very complete and important word that you've hidden in our hearts this morning for all time. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to walk through this life by faith, with the confidence and the assurance of our salvation and eternal life and eternal destiny in the kingdom of, of heaven, Lord, that uh, we would rejoice even in the sufferings and afflictions of this world as we just continue to love you with all of our heart, with all of our minds, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. And Lord, how wonderful it is for us to see that, that all of the law is bound up in love. Uh, just as Jesus said, the great commandment in the law, to love God and to love people. Lord, we uh, would be remiss if we did not provide the opportunity for anyone in our midst here today to experience that love afresh or for the first time. Lord, we know that there is the possibility for renewal for those who are in need of renewal. But we also know that anytime, anywhere, any place, the opportunity is available to anyone who would give their life to you and commit their days to you in service of you and in enjoyment with you, even of the things of this world, that uh, you would begin to form us and fit us together into the image of that body of Christ that you are so intent upon doing in your church. And so this morning, if, if you've never taken that bold step according to the faith that the Holy Spirit is implanting in your heart, if you've never taken that bold step of responding to the love of Jesus Christ with love in return for the work of salvation that he has freely provided to you, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. And so we're going to play what's called a song of invitation. And that word for boldness is an important word because it means that we're casting all of our worldly concerns behind. And in a sense, in a spiritual sense, in a great spiritual sense, we're going to walk these aisles, any one of you, you're going to walk the aisle and you're going to come into the holiest of holies where Jesus has provided the way for your admission into eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. And all of your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus, your sins have been not only forgiven, but forgotten. It was in the Hebrew's own word that he said that he will forgive your sins, he will separate you from your sins as far as the east is from the west. And the east is separated from the west infinitely. You can go east and you will never be going west. He also said that I will cast your sins into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered. So that's the promise of God. It's a very loving promise. Even Jesus, as he was nailed to the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, you know, each of us have been in that place of, of yeah, literally trampling on the body of Christ with our lives and with our lifestyle. 
And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. They want to make it all right. They want to turn the Etch-a-Sketch over. You got all those scribbles on the Etch-a-Sketch of your life. Now you're going to, anybody remember Etch-a-Sketch? Yeah. Surprised they don't have a, a uh, iPad version of it. But uh, same format. It's probably where they got the idea for the iPad. Turn it over, shake it, start all over again. And now, instead of just having these two little controls, you'll have the Word of God. And the pictures that you draw will be beautiful because they will resemble the Christ who has been made alive in you in your life. So again, it takes boldness. We understand that. This is a, a let us proposition. Nobody is ever going to force you to do anything. But if you desire, if you desire to be made alive in Christ, to be born again in Christ Jesus. And remember, Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. It wasn't me. Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. And if you would like to place your trust and your faith in that newness of life, as we play this song of invitation, I'm going to ask you to rise from your seat, come to the front. We will pray with you, and we will pray for you, and then we'll provide you a Bible and a Bible study guide, whatever you need to get off on the right step, on the right foot in your new walk in Christ. We're here for you today. You are invited to come.